The Cardinals got good starting pitching on Monday, but the heart of the order let the team down. St. Louis needs their best players to be their best players. That's coming up on B-Shape Daily. What's going on, everyone, and welcome in to this edition of B-Shape Daily. It's Brendan Schaefer here with you in the early morning hours of Tuesday, April 9th, 2024. We're breaking down a Cardinal loss on this episode of the show as Miles Michaelis gave the Cardinals a pretty good start on Monday. Six and two-thirds innings, two runs allowed. But the lineup really fell flat, and even with an opportunity late to come through and wash away the sins of the early innings of this game, the heart of the Cardinal order was not able to come through in the clutch as we saw consecutive strikeouts by Gorman and Arenado, the Nolans, to end things in the bottom of the 10th inning as the Cardinals fell to the Phillies 5-3 to three at Bush Stadium. Welcome into the show tonight, everybody. As I record this thing very late in the night slash early in the morning, getting started around 1 a.m., because I was down at Bush Stadium for tonight's game, covering the game, driving home, finishing up my article for KMOV, which I really would appreciate you guys all going and checking out, KMOV.com slash sports. The title of the article is very similar to the title of this YouTube video because, to me, that was the takeaway for the Cardinals tonight in this loss. You get a home run from Yvonne Herrera. That's exciting. The catcher continuing to show that he could carry the lumber for this team. And how about Mason Wynn coming up with a clutch hit in the ninth inning to extend the game in the first place? I thought the Phillies maybe made a mistake in that spot, even pitching to Mason Wynn with Victor Scott on deck. And we'll talk about Victor Scott a little bit tonight as well. Because for as much as I have been in his corner and supporting the idea that he is a guy that, despite maybe the limitations for him offensively at this point in his career, can help the Cardinals win games and can be a force for good in that roster spot as the everyday center fielder, I want to talk about a little bit of the trend I'm seeing offensively, whereas I've said I don't view it the way other people maybe have, that he's so overmatched and he can't... Look, he's had some strikeouts, he's had... Obviously, not a lot of success at the plate and a very low batting average. But I feel like he's been putting the ball in play and has been hanging in there about as well as I could expect him to do so against Major League Pitching without ever having been to AAA for even a moment in his career. I haven't really minded it. I know the batting average is rough, and I still feel like you have a a three-for-five day, which he's just as capable of doing. Suddenly, you look at the overall numbers, and it doesn't look that bad. But I will say that Monday was the first day that I started to get concerned for his approach at the plate, not because he was striking out five times or something in the game, but there were multiple occasions where he attempted a bunt and he didn't succeed in any of these. He was he was out both times. I, I believe it was two times that he was uh, able to put the ball in play on a bunt that I don't know if he's calling for these or the team is calling for these or perhaps a combination of the two. But I think if Victor Scott is going up attempting a bunt half the time he comes to the plate or more, which is really what it seemed like over the past few days, that may be an indication about the way he's feeling a little more so than the results of these at-bats even, which again, the batting average is is 077 or whatever it is right now. But I've been of the mindset that you're not hindering the guy's development if he's going up there and battling and learning on the job as he continues to play sterling defense and be a threat anytime he gets on base for the team. I but if he's going up there bunting every time, that's different. That's that's hardly even playing the game. I think the way that it's ultimately going to be played offensively for Victor Scott once he gets his bearings and and I think has a a, a long successful MLB career offensively, he's not going to be bunting in half of his at bats. I think there are opportunities to bunt and he should utilize them, but it really has gotten to the point where I think the defense is expecting it because he hasn't really demonstrated the ability to, or at least maybe the comfort with the idea of battling out these at-bats and just letting it play out in a natural way. I think if you're bunting, that's because you have confidence in your skill set to be able to lay the bunt down and use your legs to potentially beat something out at first base. And that's fine, but I think it's kind of overkill at this point for Victor Scott. And so that's the first time I've kind of looked at it and said, man, I'm a little bit, I'm a little bit unsure about where he goes from here. I would honestly just like to see him play it out. I would like to see him take these at-bats learn from the ones that don't end up, you know, going productively. And there's going to be plenty of those. But it's not just Victor Scott having those types of ABs. But you do look at the batting average and the numbers, and they start to add up. 
And then the plate approach thing is, okay, if he's thinking bunt every time he goes up there, maybe that's indicative more of where he is at the plate. And I think for right now, the Cardinals are, are going to ride this out. I think they should ride this out. But I would also say, you know, there are going to be time and place for the bunt. I wouldn't break it out as often as Victor is doing right now because I don't think it's as valuable when the defense is expecting it. And I heard a caller as I was driving home tonight on the, the Camo X postgame show who said they think he should bunt. And that's just evidence that somebody's not actually watching these games because he's. I think he's actually bunting too much at this point in time. To the extent that if I were Phillies tonight and I were watching that game unfold and the at-bats that Victor was taking and I'm in that ninth inning situation facing Mason Wynn with a guy on third, there's no question in my mind that I'm walking Mason Wynn in that spot. And I might be on an island on this one because I asked some of the beat writers while we were waiting for Ollie Marmel. We kind of talked about it. And I, I don't know that anybody else really uh, fully agreed with my take on that, but I am resolute. I don't. I, don't, I just don't think there's any way... I know that Mason Wynn is a rookie player who's not proven a whole lot at this level yet, but he's batting over 300, one of two Cardinals in the lineup tonight who can say that, Ivan Herrera being the other at this point. He had the home run tonight just off the glove of Brandon Marsh in left field there. But I 100% said it in the moment, and, and I'm in a group chat with a fantasy baseball group where I said, I'm I'm not going to spoil this for you guys because I am at the game. Sometimes they think if I send something that I'm spoiling a moment that they just haven't gotten to see on television yet. But I said, I would be walking Mason Wynn here. I'm surprised they're not doing it because of the way that Mason Wynn's been, you know, putting the ball in play and seeing the ball. It's not like they needed a home run in that spot. The Cardinals only needed a base hit, and that's exactly what Mason provided. And then Victor almost beat out a ground ball to, to the first baseman, but was thrown out by a half a step. And it worked out for the Cardinals in that he was able to serve as the Manford man, the 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 bonus base runner on second for the bottom of the 10th inning. But the Cardinals give up the runs in the top of the 10th. I don't have any issue really with the way that it was managed or handled. You start with an out that Ryan Helsley was able to come up with. And then Bryce Harper is the guy you walk intentionally because now you can set up the double play to to potentially end the inning. And, and realistically, that should end the game if the Cardinals can get out of the top of the 10th there without giving up any runs. But Alec Bohm just puts a ball just inside the third base bag, goes down the line, and suddenly... You're you're in a bad way if you're Ryan Helsley and the Cardinals, and there's just there's just not a lot you can do about that. I know I heard some people commenting, well, Arenado's got to protect the lines there, no doubles defense. I really don't even agree with that. I just think it was one of those hits that it's it's just you tip your cap. It's it's not fair. It's the way baseball be sometimes. But to me, I look at that and go, that's just one of those moments that there's not really anybody did not, anything wrong. They had the plan and. They, you know, executed it to the best of their abilities. But in that spot, Bohm puts it down the line and, and it's out of the reach of Arenado. And, and from there, you, you've kind of got the uphill climb. But even then, we'll get into the middle of the order, which was the topic I really wanted to dive into with this video. Make sure you hit that subscribe button in the lower right corner of your screen if you enjoy Cardinals content all season long. But guys, number two, three, and four in the order tonight for the Cardinals did not live up to expectations. And you can look so far this season, and that's basically been the story. Tonight, they go combined two for 15 with seven strikeouts, and two of those strikeouts coming in the bottom of the 10th. You had first and third. Goldie was able to get the base hit to move uh, Victor Scott over to third base from second. Victor probably could have scored on that had he read the line drive correctly off the bat, but it was just outside the, uh, the, the leaping reach of the shortstop's glove. So I don't have a huge issue with Victor Scott waiting and then seeing the ball go into the outfield and, and being held up at third base because his run is not the one that mattered. It would have been 5-4. You still needed that second run to be able to to come across in order to, to tie the game back up. And there was every opportunity to do that after Goldschmidt's base hit. When you have Gorman and Arenado, three and four in your lineup, a chance to gap one and, and tie the game, score Goldie from first, or maybe somebody hits a home run. Gorman hit two of them yesterday. And that could have ended the game in the Cardinals' favor. Instead, we see both of those Nolans strike out. And it was a continuation of a trend that has just kind of been slogging along early this season for the Cardinals. The middle of the order, the heart of the lineup, those guys have not really been producing to the level that we're normally accustomed to seeing from them. And that's a problem for the Cardinals. Right now, they're 5-6. and six. You drop a, a game below 500, and, and I don't think anybody should be panicking about the state of the organization and the fact that they're you know, below 500, they're in the mix. They need to be right around 500, I think, to uh, to to really feel like they're still in the mix for this thing. 
and then hopefully you see the the building blocks and the foundation that's being built with the rotation. That's something that can continue. Miles was good tonight. Six and two-thirds, had a, a spot of trouble there in the fifth inning, gave up a couple of runs that he wasn't able to to shake those base runners off the off the trees. But six and two-thirds and two runs, I, you, could, you could pencil that into your Excel sheet and just click all the way to the end of the column through 162, and I think you would take that every single time if you're the Cardinals. But the problem is you've seen a Cardinals team that about half their games, give or take, they have scored three or fewer runs this season. And I think that's really what boils down to the issue that the Cardinals are having right now because they're not that far off from being, you know, six and five, maybe even seven and four with a nice winning record. A couple of these close games have not gone their way. And really, to me, it's been the offense in in those games, especially this one tonight, that if you if you come up with a little bit more against the opposing starter, Spencer Turnbull, who had six scoreless innings, he's now got eleven scoreless innings on the young season. But he's a guy that had an ERA over seven last year. I believe he was with Detroit before coming over to Philadelphia. And the Cardinals got two hits against him tonight. And you're able to do some things off the bullpen. But Michaelis gave you a chance to win. Michaelis should have had a win tonight. If you go six and two-thirds and give up two, this, this Cardinal lineup needs to be robust enough that that's enough, that that's enough to, to back your starter. But the Cardinals didn't score any runs while Michaelis was in the game. They waited until after he departed to be able to start laying the wood, but it it ends up being just not quite enough. It's impressive that the Cardinals were able to score three runs between innings seven, eight, and nine, but I think you've got to be able to do a couple of things. One, if that happens where you have some bad breaks and some bad luck in the top of the 10th, which, again, you get an out, Ryan Helsley does what he needs to do, then you set up Bryce Harper to be intentionally walked because that's the one guy in their lineup who you know is very liable to beat you. And then when Bohm hits a, you know, he beats the ball into the dirt six feet away from home plate and it goes literally over the bag into the left field corner. One run scores from that, but the it allowed the other run in Bryce Harper to advance into scoring position um, at third base at that point, I believe, because of the fact that he was put on intentionally setting up the possibility to be able to strand all the runners. So that's where it's like, look, did you really want to face Bryce Harper? That could be your gripe perhaps that they shouldn't have, that they shouldn't have done that. But I think realistically, we all kind of know what Bryce Harper is and, and, and the damage that he can do. And you're trying to keep that tie game because you know, you've got Victor Scott going to be your base runner at second, the bottom of the 10th. You're trying to hold it serve so that you can win the game in the bottom half. Once it, once you start putting guys on base, that makes life on Helsley a little bit more difficult where Harper's run eventually does come around to score. So now you've got the deficit of two runs, which just means, Hey, that that's time for two, three, four in your lineup to, to put something together in the bottom of the 10th inning. And you get the base hit from Goldie. You've got two on one out and your best hitters are coming to the plate. And right now the Cardinals need their best hitters to start performing again, like their best hitters. And we just have not seen it to this point in the year where we see, even though Goldsmith does get that base knock in the in the tenth inning there tonight, he ends the night as does Nolan Arenado with an OPS for the season below 600. They're at 594 and 597 respectively, and we're just not seeing the power output from either of those guys right now. Goldie had the big opening day out in, in Los Angeles, three hits, had a home run that day. I believe it's five for 44 is Paul Goldsmith following that opening day game where he had where he had it going. And since then, he's batting 114 with no extra base hits. Nolan Arenado did have a nice-looking swing tonight on a double to left. He's starting to pull the ball a little bit, but we still haven't really seen him do it with authority, not home run authority, because Arenado's next home run will be the first home run that he's hit since August 19th of 2023. It's a span of 159 plate appearances after tonight where Arenado has not hit for a home run. And the batting average is is fine. He's been able to get some base hits this season so far. But like we said, nothing really in the in the way of power to this point. And he has also not drawn a walk in 11 games this season, which I think is a fair concern because it's not that he's just being more selective with the pitches that he hits and merely not running into any walks yet. It's that I think he's swinging at everything, and we're seeing that some of the swings, if you watch it, it's the half-swing variety. It's a 
a habit that I know Cardinals fans have been irked by to see from him, but I think it's been pretty consistent, especially early on this year. I think we saw it down the latter part of last year. We're seeing it again now, and it does make you wonder kind of like from a health perspective, is there something going on? Is it just not feeling comfortable in the box at all times? The fact he's not drawing walks either to me is is a bit of a concern. Now, do I have long-term concern for Nolan Arenado that he's just never going to hit a home run again? No, but this is a prolonged slump, and it does kind of make you scratch your head a little bit as to how the Cardinals can maybe expect him to get out of this thing and to have Paul Goldschmidt slumping a little bit at the same time. And this is, outside of that opening day game, a continuation for Goldschmidt from what we saw from him in spring, which the spring numbers don't don't count. I get that. I get that you're not going to go too crazy about something that happens in spring, but we've kind of seen a continuation of that from Goldie where it's just that the power has just not consistently been there for two of your biggest sluggers. Now, Nolan Gorman's average with an 0 for 5 tonight drops down to 195. But the other side of that coin is he did hit a couple of home runs yesterday, so it's not been all too far removed for him from being able to display some power. But I really think you look at the way that Goldsmith and Arenado are going, it's not like it's day one anymore. It is still early, but you're 11, 11 games into the season, you know, a 15th of the way through the season or whatever it is, that's a sample size at this point. It's not a huge one, but it's enough to go, man, if these guys are going to be, you know, the the dudes that have to carry the lumber for you and they're not coming through, what is the build of this roster that's going to make it successful? And maybe the answer in that case will be the, the pitching just having to be better than that middle of the pack range that we have sort of prescribed for this rotation. I think the bullpen can be pretty good bullpen. But let's be real. I just don't think the Cardinals are going to be in a spot that they'll they'll be vying for a playoff opportunity if Arenado and Goldschmidt aren't Arenado and Goldschmidt. And this isn't me saying you have to press the panic button now if you're a Cardinals fan um, because you know they're not performing and this is who they're going to be forever and always. I don't think that's necessarily the case. But I, I mean, it is kind of fair to wonder. Maybe they're not this bad because again, a sub 600 OPS for two guys who are. You know, we're on a Hall of Fame track kind of heading into this season with the careers that they have had respectively. I don't think they're going to have a 590 OPS this year. I don't think that's going to be their numbers at the end of the season. But when you kind of add to it Goldie's rough spring and you kind of add to it Arenado's, you know, last six weeks or whatever it was last year where he didn't homer and the power has is, is seemed kind of sapped from his game and he's not being selective at the plate because he's swinging it kind of a, a lot of those pitches and he's half swinging, he's check swinging, and and the power just doesn't seem to be there in his game right now. All those things could add up to it. Okay, they're not going to be a 590 OPS, but what if they're you know a 750 OPS or a 725 OPS instead of the the customary certainly above 800, but more like 850 or 900 that we're used to seeing from both of those guys as honestly perennial MVP candidates outside of last year. That's what we expect both of them to be. Goldie won the darn thing in 2022, was the National League most valuable player. And right now we're just not seeing that that version of those players. And I just am going to say, I'm not, I'm not telling you panic that it's never going to happen, but if the Cardinals don't get those versions of those players, I don't think this is going to be a productive season for them. It can turn around on a dime. You're still early enough in the year that a, a four for five with two home runs by either of them is going to flip the OPS is going to flip all the numbers and make things look like they're totally hunky dory. But for right now, it, especially in a game where where in the clutch situations, you didn't see these guys coming through. Again, Goldie did have the base hit in the tenth, but Arenado's double was earlier in the game. And when you needed Arenado and, and Gorman there in that tenth inning, you didn't you didn't get anything from them. They weren't able to put the balls in play. And from a power perspective, the Cardinals, as of this recording right now, uh, late the night on on Monday night, early Tuesday. The Cardinals are fourth from the bottom in Major League Baseball in home runs. They've hit eight. The White Sox and Guardians have hit seven in one fewer game. The Minnesota Twins have only hit four home runs, but that's in three fewer games than the Cardinals have logged to this point. So just not a lot of power to speak of, and the power that you are getting is coming from Ivan Herrera hitting two home runs, which is great. That's awesome to see. Wilson Contreras has two home runs as well. You know, the rest of this Cardinals team just has not been able to provide very much thunder. And I guess I can even add to that. Like I can diagnose all these homers for you. Gorman had the two yesterday. 
So Arenado, again, not since August 19th, over 150 plate appearances in a row where he has not hit a home run. That is outlandish. It's kind of a weird thing because a home run's a hard thing to do. Like, I feel like sometimes you're nitpicky if you're saying, oh, a guy's not hitting, not hitting for power, he's not hitting home runs. It's like, yeah, you go try it. It's tough. And so you understand that guys, if they're not really locked in, are going to have a hard time sometimes. But for Nolan Arenado, of all people, guy who's a perennial 30 and 100 type of candidate, 30 homers, 100 RBIs, to go a quarter of a baseball season effectively without a home run, because that's what 159 plate appearances is. You might you might pace more like 650 in a season if you're batting up in the order like he consistently is. But you can you can pace that out. 159 times four is going to get you to about what is it 636. That's a 25 percent of a baseball season. And Nolan Arenado, who is the the cleanup hitter, the power producer for this team in theory, hasn't homered in that span of time. So that's the point where it's like, all right, as much as I don't like to ride guys, well, hey, where's the power? Where are the home runs? Where are they? Like this Cardinal team is bereft right now of the consistent power up and down the lineup. And that's why I look at it and say, man, coming into this year on paper, I like the team. I like the batting order. I like the lineup. But if, if you're going to have an, an Arenado that doesn't hit homers, hits seven or eight this year or 10 or Jordan Walker without, you know, he's kind of in a similar spot hitting, hitting the ball, not necessarily on the launch angle for power through the air. Walker has had some some nice swings at times, but it hasn't resulted in in him coming up with a home run either. And he's got a 536 OPS with a 182 batting average. Brennan Donovan, leading off for the Cardinals, has done a nice job. I'm just kind of going up and down the lineup here. His OPS is near 900. Yvonne Herrera is at 873. Those two, basically, they lead the team. Contreras is probably up there as well but is uh, still out of the lineup. He was supposed to be in the lineup today, and I believe as the catcher. Was going to DH the other day, uh, Sunday, and then was scratched late. And then today, the similar situation happens where that that hand is just not responding. And so that's I, I think you're seeing Lars Nupar, too, go on another, another rehab assignment in Springfield this week. We may not see him until Friday when you start to think about the, the mechanics of this. Going to Springfield to play tomorrow. Wednesday is a day game for the big league club, and then off Thursday, so I think Friday, Newpar will be in St. Louis, or rather, he'll be on that road trip and he'll be in the lineup, if I had to guess. But until then, you're you're just kind of cobbling it together with the guys that you have. Burleson's got a 448 OPS. Mentioned Walker. Uh, Wynn's got a nice batting average. He was two for four tonight with a 333 average now. But the 744 OPS comes because he just hasn't hit for much power yet. Gorman's at a 657 on the OPS, even after the two home runs last night, or yesterday afternoon, rather. I mentioned Goldie at, at a 594 OPS. Arenado's hitting 261, but for no power. So 597 on the OPS. Just up and down this lineup, the Cardinals do, I mean, you've got more than half the lineup. Victor Scott's, you know, he's OPS in 291. We talked about him already. I think it's I think it's going to be a situation where he's so valuable in the field. Uh, he's getting on base at such a low clip that I was not concerned about, you know, development and, hindering those sorts of things. But I think they've they've gone too far in the direction of he's just basically up there to bunt at this point in time. You're almost conceding the at-bat if he's not able to lay one down in a good spot. That's not really healthy for a guy who's, you know, 22, 23 years old trying to make his way. So if, if he is not going to go out there and at least swing the bat, then at some point in time, I do think you'll have a different conversation to be had about, about having him on this team. I personally would just like to see him, hey, just go out there and swing, battle, and, you know, Whatever happens is, is going to be what happens. And if he has to go down to AAA at some point in time, that's what's going to be the case. Personally, I would not be doing it until after you get Edmund or Carlson back because I don't prefer for the Cardinals to move Newt Bar to center field. You can do it, but it's also going to be a downstream effect about having a less capable left fielder. And you've got Jordan Walker on the other side defensively. I, I understand it. Victor Scott's going to be a work in progress offensively. I also don't subscribe, though, to this notion that you can ruin him by having him come up here and struggle for uh, you know a, a few weeks or a month, and then going back to AAA, suddenly he's his whole career in baseball, his life in baseball is forgotten because he got he got blown out of the water for a few weeks by MLB pitching. I don't think that's necessarily going to happen to Victor Scott. I think if and when he goes down, he can make those adjustments and recognize that look, you 
you got a taste of it. You got a taste of maybe what you still lacked, and you can kind of go from there. But he's hit no 77, and that's the reality. So I, we're going to have to wait and see what happens there. I'm, again, still in favor of keeping him with the big club because I do think that there are things he's bringing to the table that are that are impactful. And until you have a Tommy Eben that can play center field, which Tommy Eben started hitting off a tee from both sides of the plate again, he's been cleared to do that. So maybe it could be sooner rather than later that the Cardinals um, would, would get the benefit of Tommy back in center field. And certainly he'll he'll give you more than an 077 batting average and hopefully give you some some similar good defense in center. Although I don't think there's anybody that can that can do what Victor Scott can do in center field defensively, maybe not in Major League Baseball. And he still doesn't look entirely comfortable, like just confident in himself every time. Some of the routes he takes to balls, it's like he is sprinting to the spot and then he gets there and doesn't know what to do with himself. That happened one uh, on a ball to the wall tonight in dead center field. And those ones straight at him have been the ones that I have noticed have been a little bit harder to judge, but he he gets there and then he just kind of the mechanics of making the catch just look like a little jumpy. But that's okay. He's you know twenty three years old and just has all the skill set in the world when it comes to playing the position of center field defensively. I'm really excited about what the the future and even the present in, in watching him on a daily basis is in center field. But the bottom line is, I'm not really too heavily going to scrutinize the bottom of the order when you've got Jordan Walker hitting 180. You got Burleson hitting 180, and I, to me, it's two, three, four in the lineup that have got to get it going. You can't have two for 15 with seven Ks and expect to win that game, especially when two of those strikeouts come with with men on the corners in the tenth inning for Gorman and Arenado tonight. That's where it boils down for me. Can these guys step up and be themselves, and can they do it sooner rather than later? Because it won't be a moment too soon when when the arrival for this offense happens. Yeah, we'll be it, not a moment too soon indeed. We'll see what they're able to do and if it's able to happen before too long. But the longer you go and you don't see that breakout from these guys, it's just such a bummer to have all three of them kind of slumping at the same time, which is not to say that Gorman was slumping yesterday when he was hitting two home runs. But when you're two, three, four in the lineup and you're going 594, 657, and 597 with the OPS, that is going to have a, a significant impact on the number of runs you score as a team, because those are supposed to be your best players, and 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 what your lineup is going to be on a night to night basis, it's going to impact the number of games you can win if that group of players is not producing offensively. And no, to me, the answer is not. Well, you move Mason Wynn up in the lineup, you move Ivan Herrera up in the lineup. I mean, Herrera has already been batting in some pretty prominent slots. He was the the cleanup man for the home opener. He's batting fifth tonight, and he's swinging a nice bat. I think even when Contreras comes back. That is maybe a change that I would make, and I would say I get that Newpar might be coming into his own here, and he's going to be able to join the team on Friday. But I don't know, man. I might have to find a way to to keep uh, Pedro Pajes here if you're not comfortable enough to have both catchers in the lineup at the same time, which I think the answer is just be comfortable with it. And if there's an injury again, then Pajes is on the first flight back or the first Uber back, whatever the case is for him. But Herrera, I mean, if you're going to, going to rank the Cardinals – Top five hitters right now, Herrera and Contreras, when both healthy, are both in that in that category. Donovan's there, and and you know maybe it's Mason Wynn because everybody else is just not really produced, and Mason Wynn's at least making contact and and picking up base hits. But I don't think this just makes it time to rush Mason Wynn up to the top of the lineup. No, I think you need your top of the lineup to be your top of the lineup, and you need those guys to perform. the The twenty twenty four Cardinals are cooked; they're cooked where they stand. If you don't get Arenado, Gorman, and Goldsmith going, they're going to need Jordan Walker too. They're going to need these other guys in the lineup as well. But like the best teams, you see it every night throughout baseball. And that's why this is such a frustration. While I simultaneously don't want to say, hey, I'm demanding you need to hit some homers middle of the order, like that's your job because that's a tough job. But when it is incumbent upon you in those slots in the order, that is kind of what you have to do. You have to hit home runs. All all night, you look throughout the throughout the game, and you're seeing the updates on the notifications on your phone, especially if you play fantasy. Of oh, there goes Shohei, there goes Matt Olson, there goes there goes there goes Ellie De La Cruz. Like the other teams have it. It's not. It, it should not be that different for the St. Louis Cardinals when you have the lineup on paper that the St. Louis Cardinals have. Their best hitters need to be their best hitters. Ollie Marmel, he he seems to believe that it's not time to panic. Um, he said very low concern. I'll play for you a quote from what he was asked about post game, but 
the best the best players have got to be the best players at a certain point in time. But let's go ahead and take a listen to Ollie Marmel from Monday night being asked about the situation as it pertains to his offense and in particular the middle of the order that has really struggled of late. Goldie, Foreman, and Arenado. Yeah, uh, those are guys that'll tell you that um, they're working through it, plain and simple. And um, we've seen it before where they have a stretch where they don't feel great and then it clicks overnight and they take off. So uh, my concern level is very low. Um, yeah. And Marvel was asked later on by Derek Gould of the Post Dispatch for a little bit more specifically on Paul Goldsmith is what he was looking for. And this is this is up on the Bally Sports Midwest. Um, Twitter as well. I, I believe they showed that that version on television if you want to listen back to it, but was asked about Goldschmidt and all he said, I feel like I already answered that. That's really, I don't, he didn't really want to add much more to what he was saying. He kind of leaned on the, the quote that I just played for you there. And another question about Goldschmidt was, yep, I feel like I've kind of answered that. My concern is low. There's not really a lot to get into if you're the Cardinals. There's no there's no upside to going, yep, these guys are not taking quality at bats right now because they're the veterans of the team, right? Whether it's fair or unfair, if it were a young guy being asked about that's going over, would Ollie maybe answer it differently? You might, you might at least have him find a willingness to describe the at bats, but he's not touching that. He's not touching anything about the at bats that, that you're going to see from or that you are currently seeing from Gorman which and he is one of the young guys, but especially Arenado and Goldschmidt, who who are kind of the guys that, that have been focused in on. It's easy for Ollie. He'd be able to say, "Well, the guy homered twice yesterday. What do you, you know, what do you get on Gorman about?" But the other two, I think, are the the ones that are the most prominent veteran leaders in in, in the lineup, the clubhouse. Like this is the way it's got to be for this team to thrive, and they're the guys not performing right now. Um, although that being said, he was asked about Victor Scott earlier this weekend and said he likes the at-bats that he's taking. It wasn't even like somebody was trying to play gotcha, but the question was framed in a way that said, obviously, Victor is struggling at the plate kind of right now. And he cut the question and said, no, I don't I don't think he's struggling at the plate. I like the at-bats he's taking. I agreed with that until I see all the bunts tonight where it's like, if that's really the way, it's, there's a time and place. But if it's happening with that level of frequency, it might suggest to me that there's just a lack of comfort maybe um, in the way he's going about some of those ABs. But that being said, like I also, I also understand him trying to find ways to get himself on base because his his chances to score a run when he's on base are much higher than almost anybody else in the leagues because of what he does with his speed. He's he's already, you know, he scored six runs on the season. I still think that's second on the team, if I'm not mistaken, to Brendan Donovan, who's your leadoff guy. And you've got Victor Scott batting ninth every day, but, but the one that he let off. They're batting eighth or ninth or down in the order at a minimum. So that's another two cents on Victor Scott in that situation, which again, I think will continue to evolve. Um, I don't think he's the guy that should go down when Newpark comes up, but we'll see if if maybe it takes a few more at bats and it's just not looking the way the Cardinals want it to look. They could pull the plug on it, despite how, how good he's been defensively. I think you'll quickly notice a decline in performance for your pitching staff if those those balls aren't being tracked down in the gaps in center field and, and deep center at the wall. So wait until you're really confident that you've got the defense to be able to supplement and replace what you've been getting production-wise there from Victor Scott before you make the move, but that's just me. But the bottom line here is, and I, I think Cardinals fans will agree, but let me know if you disagree in the comments section below, the best hitters have got to be the best hitters. The best players on this team have got to be the group that carries this team. Uh, Tyler O'Neill is hitting bombs. I know that's that's irksome to everybody that he's got like five home runs on the season. It was never going to happen here. It just wasn't. And I'm not saying that's an excuse or, or something that the Cardinals should feel fine about on their behalf. I'm not stumping for it. We, we told you this would happen. Like, we all knew this was, was going to happen. And I think there are some Cardinals fans who say, okay, let's see if he stays healthy throughout the year because that's really been the question with him. But I think it's a situation where he was, was just not going to have success with the Cardinals and he gets his mind right going to a new organization where he, where he gets a fresh start. You don't have any any of the the whatever happened in the past bogging you down, and so he's hitting and he's hitting with authority. He's got five home runs. I think he's like leading baseball in OPS or something crazy like that. Cardinals have eight home runs as a team, and they have got to find a way to get these guys who, on paper, you go, hey, that's a dude, that's a dude that can match, that's a middle order bat, that's a cleanup hitter. These guys have got to hit. It's eleven games in. Are you panicking, Cardinals fans, about the way that the off? I did I not say since day one of the season. 
since that first series against Los Angeles, I said, you know, if I'm looking at that first series, it's not the pitching to me that's a concern. I know that that was everybody's topic of conversation coming into the year because they had to replace so many starters and they had to they shook up the bullpen. I said, the, what I'm seeing from the offense is a little bit, you know, underwhelming. And that's going to be the thing that can hold them back because the expectations are higher on the offense than it is on the rotation. It's built that way by design. When you go out and spend $10, $11 million on back-end rotation guys like Lynn and Gibson, you're not asking them to go win you Cy Young. You're not asking those guys to carry your team. You're asking those guys to set a foundation for your team to just be middle of the pack. Just don't let the starting rotation be the thing that tanks this season before it ever really gets out of the gate because that's how they felt about the rotation last year. And so they addressed it with the guys they went out and got. And I think so far, despite Kyle Gibson having some trouble in that first inning on on Sunday, and I think that's something you probably won't see again from him, at least not in the near future. Hopefully some of the things that were happening there got corrected. But I don't think it's the pitching staff that you got to be worried about right now. If the pitching staff was designed to be 15th in baseball, and it's basically performing around that mark right now, give or take, if that's the way it was designed, your offense was designed, if you're admitting that about your pitching staff, which I don't think they would, they would say, no, we think we have a great rotation. I think we can all look at the numbers and go, they're not bad, but I think I, I think they're going to be more in that you know, 10 to 15 range, 12 to 15, to 15 range in terms of the rotation. But if that's the way it's designed and it's performing per, perhaps as designed, give or take, then the offense has got to do its part. It's got to be a top eight, top six offense. And right now, it's it's not a top twenty offense. Maybe in run scored, they're they're on that they're straddling that line. But OPS, I imagine they're probably below. And I, just predictive, like the names in the lineup, I would take over so many other teams. But they're twenty third in OPS right now. They're they're th- you know they're tied for fourth from the bottom in home runs with the only teams trailing them having played fewer games. You have to hit homers in, the, in this league for it to work, and I know the Cardinals have have enjoyed kind of being the throwback. We're going to do it different. We're going to go with starters that go deep into games, and that's how we're going to build. We're going to That can work on the pitching side. On the hitting side, you've got to – you need loud contact. It was great when they won 8-5 to five over the Marlins, and they had that – they batted around, and they had the five-run inning because they, they had some hits drop in, and they were – playing line-to-line baseball offensively, you got to hit some home runs. And I know that Bush Stadium is not conducive to that either, but you play half your games on the road, and it's it just has not been enough. And you can homer at Bush Stadium too, by the way. Teams do it all the time. So what do you think, Cardinals fans? I've ranted long enough. I'm going to get to bed here, but I'm curious how, feel, how fans are feeling about the offense. Like, I don't think it's a very difficult mathematical equation to say, hey, Decent pitching, solid enough bullpen, plus X equals winning team that goes to the playoffs. And you got to fill in X with that offense that's going to be robust. And right now, it's toward the bottom of the league. It can't even afford to be middle of the pack. And it's toward the bottom right now. So what has to happen? Do you feel like these are just guys that are going to come around? Goldie, Arenado, Gorman. Are these guys that are just going to come around and you're not too panicked about it? Or... Do you kind of look at the start and go, well, how do I know it's not a sign of things to come? I'm curious for the the temperature of the fan base on that one. Let me know in the comments below. Make sure you hit like and subscribe on this video so you can have Cardinals content coming your way all season long. By the way, I posted a video uh, earlier tonight, right after the game ended, of a little clip from our, our Friday episode of Hot Take Central on 590 The Fan last week. Jimmy the Cat Hayes, you guys love the cat. Cam Jansen is the former Blues enforcer. Great dude. I don't know what I don't know why if you enjoy Cardinals content, if you join my channel in particular, you wouldn't want to be clicking on those videos and checking them out as well. Um, I think you guys will start to like, even if you're not a, a listener of the show normally, um, I'm on that show every Friday now. I think you will start to enjoy the content there. So give some of those videos a chance as I begin to incorporate uh, those onto the channel from time to time, in addition to just the hardcore solo baseball talk. You know, many of you guys listen to me and Charlie Marlowe on his YouTube channel with Low Hanging Fruit. The, the, the Cardinal podcast that we do weekly-ish. So this is just kind of some other content that'll be on the channel. And I genuinely think if I were a listener, I would listen to that stuff before I'd listen to the everyday hardcore baseball stuff, which is the baseball stuff is great. But I don't know. I have a lot more fun 
doing the shows where I'm I'm with some of those other guys, and it doesn't get any better than than the cat and me talking baseball. So check those out if you see them. Um, I'll try to delineate so that when you click on the video, you'll be able to tell like with based on what the the thumbnail is. If it's the picture, the the goofy, I I photoshopped my head onto Charlie Marlowe's body, waiting to see if he notices that or makes fun of that. But um, just that kind of stuff. If you guys enjoy Cardinals content and just general kind of sports talk content, that's some other stuff that when I'm on the show, I'll be able to put um, some of the most interesting tidbits onto the channel as we go along here uh, on YouTube. And make sure to subscribe to to Be Safe Daily on Spotify. But that really is going to do it for this edition of the show. I appreciate you guys, as always, for listening. And we'll talk to you next time on Be Safe Daily. Peace.